<laughs> okay. Um, so, um, I'm a supporter of Left Unity. Um, you have to remember, Left Unity is a new uh, development, a new political project in England because it came out of an appeal from a very famous film director some of you might have heard of, Ken Loach. You might have seen the film Land and Freedom, the film about Ireland, the wind that uh, moves the, the barley, and uh, some other fantastic films. He's probably the best filmmaker at actually representing the working class uh, in, in the English-speaking world. He made this appeal because he felt that the Labour Party has become a social liberal party that does do nothing really to fight austerity or provide an alternative for working people. And therefore we need to develop an alternative to Labour. Okay? As a response to that, there's been about 8,000 people sign that appeal. There's a website set up, you can see it. And there's been around 70 groups set up around the whole of England and Wales. Recently, we had a meeting and there were at least 50 of those groups represented. We are having a full conference in November to establish Left Unity. So at the moment, it's still very embryonic, but I'm very encouraged by that development. Okay. I want you just to look at this picture a little bit, this picture of Beppe Grillo. I don't know if you can see. He's in a rubber dinghy being carried by the crowd to the platform at his meeting. I think it, it's a very interesting picture because I think it sums up or expresses a lot about Beppe Grillo's movement. First of all, it's very imaginative, yeah? Because have you ever seen that before? A political leader being carried on a rubber dinghy across a crowd. Secondly, he did it, deli he did it deliberately to suggest that his supporters, he can trust. He has belief in them. That he's part of that movement. He's on a sea of citizens. And also, it's to take the mickey, to, to if you like, um, be satirical against all the criticism he has that he's some quasi-fascist, some demagogue, some uh, strong man that's emerging. Because what, what fascist would go across this crowd in a rubber dinghy? I mean, you just couldn't imagine it. So it, it, it's very clever, I think, and it shows you something about the Beppe Grillo movement. But of course, the interesting thing about it is that on one of these occasions, the people actually dropped Beppe Grillo, and he hurt his back very badly, and uh, he stopped doing it after that. So whether that tells you something about the future of the movement, I don't know. But anyway, the second thing I want to say is that it's very important to approach this movement in a respectful way and, and in an honest way and in a way that is clear about the movement because some commentators have denounced the movement as a quasi-fascist movement or an anti-political movement or even some sort of bourgeois conspiracy. There's an article by Wun, uh, Win, Wu Ming uh, which more or less describes the movement just as a bourgeois conspiracy to if, like, deviate the movement into a false end. I think all those analyses are wrong. That doesn't mean he's a left movement either, but all those analyses are wrong. And I think we have to learn from both the strengths and the weaknesses of this movement. All right? There are things we can learn, but obviously, as I'll go on to show, there are lots of things wrong with it as well. It's also possible to have lots of discussion about all the political aspects of this movement. But as the theme of this conference is very much about the internet, I'm trying to focus on the relationship between this movement and the internet. I think we could have a great discussion, for example, about the social basis of the Five Star Movement, because it, there's links with other things happening in other countries. What is the social basis of this movement? The role of the young people with precarious jobs, the unemployed, the independent workers, the people not in the public sector. They're, they're very interesting things about the social basis. But I want to focus on the internet. And there are five main things I want to talk about. Firstly, I want to give some background on the rise of the uh, Five Star Movement 
and how it's grown using the internet. That's the first aspect. Second aspect, I want to explain how the movement itself theorizes its growth, right? How it explains itself, if you like, and how it, how it explains that growth in terms of the internet and the web itself, and the web as a key structural transformer of society and politics. The third aspect I want to talk about is uh, how this analysis and this vision of a web-based direct democracy is fundamentally flawed, fundamentally wrong, in other words. The fourth thing I want to talk about, how this theory is adapted to also organize the party internally, and how this internal organization across the web also leads to contradictions, and as we're seeing already in the last few months, but even earlier, uh, there are splits and exclusions and expulsions inside this movement, okay? Um, so that's leading to that. Finally, finally, the fifth thing I want to talk about is what we as the left can learn from this. And there's an overlap here with the discussion with the comrades from this morning and from other discussions we're going to have over the weekend, particularly the two-page thing that I got given about uh, the position of Delinka on this, okay? So, first of all, what is the, uh, the uh, Five Star Movement, and how does it use the net? Right, okay. The election results in 2013 was like a tsunami. It was a complete shake-up of Italian politics, because this party which is not a party, it's a movement, they refuse to call themselves a party, this movement went from getting 5% of the votes, or roughly, more or less, around 2009 when it was set up, today, in 2013, becoming the joint biggest party alongside the uh, Democratic Party, which is the sort of survivor of the old Communist Party, okay? 25% of the vote. Okay, that's in national elections. And the, um, the, the web has helped in building this movement because, because of the complete and total discredit of the mainstream political parties in Italy, it was able to come from outside that group of parties using the web as a space that wasn't contaminated by those political parties, what he calls the political caste. Okay? And uh, people who were already disillusioned and no, no longer active in this political caste within these political parties were there available to be a part of this new web spaced organization. Okay? And indeed, this movement didn't come from anywhere. For many years beforehand, maybe I think a dozen years beforehand, uh, there had already been Beppe Grillo no longer gone on TV, refusing to go on TV after he made a rather indelicate joke about the Craxi and the Socialist Party leadership. The joke was that uh, Claudio Martelli was in, uh, that was the second, the right-hand man of Craxi. They were in a visit, on, in, uh, a visit in China and um, Martelli says to Craxi, they're all socialists here, they're all, they're all socialists in China. And so Craxi says to him, what's the problem? And Martelli says, well, who do we rob from then if they're all socialists? Where do we rob, where do we get the money from? How can we be corrupt, in other words? And from that moment on, Grillo was outside the system. He refused any slot on the television, okay? So he said it began gradually to build up and become more and more political, taking up a whole series of issues around ecology, around uh, the, the, the way that companies were corruptly organized in Italy, the Parmalat company, for example, that scandal, he broke that. And he, he had huge um, public um, uh, theater performances, if you like, but also those theater performances with the humor became more and more political and less and less comic. But of course, they always had that comic aspect. So there was, a, and then he set up the blog. He set up a blog and that was going a certain number of years before they set up the five-star movements, okay? So in other words, 
there was a long viral march through the internet, if you like, over the years before they actually set up the uh, Five Star Movement. Okay? If you like, it physically expressed an external relationship to the mainstream parties, okay? And they got no local office, offices, hard. they got, have hardly any local offices, there's no national headquarters, there's no party structures, right? It's, it doesn't look or feel like any sort of party at all. Where their people said they had great success during the election campaign of this year was the way they used direct streaming of all the big meetings in the squares throughout Italy. Because Grillo did what he called the Tsunami Tour around 70 different spots over a couple of months. And these meetings, as meetings, were really bigger than any of the other meetings that the other mainstream parties organized. In fact, they record the sort of meetings that would have happened with the Communist Party 20 or 30 years ago. That's reality. In fact, the final meeting was actually held in the square in Rome, uh, Piazza San Giovanni, which is the square which is traditionally the square of the left, and it filled the square. Okay. So this streaming enabled not just the hundreds of thousands in the piazzas to see Grillo, but another at least a million or so as well. That was the calculations made by the staff of the movement. And that's also why the opinion polls got the whole thing wrong. They underestimated the sort of support that Grillo got. Okay? Um, now, of course, it wasn't just the web. The web wasn't the main reason why Grillo got 25%. It was a factor, an important factor, but not the main reason. The main reasons are the complete crisis of political representation in Italy, similar to the crisis of political representation elsewhere in Europe. We've seen this all over Europe where the mainstream parties are losing consensus. There's huge spaces opened up to the left of those parties and sometimes to the right of those parties. We're seeing that in England with UKIP. We're seeing in, in France to some degree with the Front de Gauche. There are spaces opened up to the left or to the right of uh, the mainstream parties. Because people quite correctly are saying they're all the same. They're all the same. All these parties are implementing austerity. Okay? And therefore, when Grillo and his movement says we're neither left nor right, he can gain support for that because in many perceptions of people, the majority of perception is that they're, they're, they're all the same. So why not just ignore those categories? Secondly, the second main factor was the scale of the, of the austerity offensive. The, the, the situation in Italy, I guess, is much worse than Luxembourg in terms of the attacks on working people. Absolutely frontal attack on the uh, wages, the social services, uh, in every way possible, of uh, working people in Italy. There's something like 40% youth unemployment in Italy at the moment, 40%. I know all this because my family, my wife is Italian, so I go there a lot, and I meet all her relatives, and they've personally been directly affected by the crisis. The young people in those families don't get jobs. They go to university years and years and years in university, and they don't get work. Or they get stupid work, like precarious work, bar work, work in the informal econ economy. Okay? So there's that huge, terrible attack on working people. And then the third thing is the corruption and the scandals, the absolute corruption that exists in Italy still. Not just about the mafia, but political corruption, we have the, which even contaminates the mainstream left party, like the PD with the Monte di Pasqua in Siena, the big bank in Siena, in which a cadre of the, of, the, of the Democratic Party are directly involved. They don't know where all the money's gone. Okay, so that's another problem. And of course, the final factor is your man that we saw before, Pepe Grillo, a fantastic, if you like, comic, able to uh, have a, captivate the crowds, to bring tens of thousands into the square. He's a, to see him live, I don't know how many people have seen him on film, he is a tremendous uh, actor, a tremendous uh, comic, able to use 
um, mimicry, to, to use language in an imaginative way, in a very clever way, a vulgarity as well. So as a qualitatively different tool, the web has helped. The web is different to the printed book. It can be very fast, very potentially interactive. And it's particularly suited, in my opinion, to that sort of operation around single issues and around electioneering, getting votes. Okay? For a situation like that, I think the net is more suited. Right? Because at the end of the day, you're getting individuals to go and vote for you. You're not trying to organize a demonstration or hold a factory, occupy a factory, or confront the, the bourgeois state in a frontal way. That's not what we're talking about here. So you can have a thing. And the other important thing, I think, about all this is the, the low cost, right? If you're coming from outside the mainstream parties, you don't have an apparatus, you don't have a political structure. The fact that it costs very, very little using the web to mobilize people is an important factor. If you look at the election costs for the various campaigns of the M5S movement, they're ridiculously small. They won the, uh, the, the, um, the mayor's job in Parma spending two or three thousand euros. Right? And that means also that they give back the electoral expenses that the state pays to them to the state. And that reinforces their profile as a clean political party that's not the same as the others. So it's all a virtuous circle. They use the web, it's very cheap. Obviously they've got the advantage of Beppe Grillo having a big profile, but still, they use the web and it's very cheap. And therefore they don't have to use the electoral expenses, the political funding from the state, so that reinforces their profile as a different sort of movement. Okay? And it involved new people, as I said before, it involved people new to politics, the abstainers, the people who never voted, the young people who aren't organized by the trade unions, the self-employed, again, who are not organized by the trade unions, and the people from the radical left and the radical social movements who were disillusioned with the mainstream parties. You've got to remember that Rifondazione, the big hope of the left in Italy, you must have followed it a few years ago, was Rifondazione, the left split from the Communist Party. I know a lot of people are involved in that. We had great hopes in England and elsewhere that this would be a great beacon for the left. Unfortunately, it collapsed once it supported the Prodi government, supported the war in Afghanistan, and basically supported austerity. And, and it's no more. So the strength of the, of the Five Star Moon is also down to the mistakes, the weaknesses, not just of the mainstream left, but of the radical left as well, us. We've also made tremendous mistakes in Italy. Now, um, the web for this movement isn't just a tool, isn't just a good electioneering tool. It's also a whole philosophy, a whole new structure that they think will transform society. And the person who, uh, Grillo, it's very interesting, a few years ago, Grillo used to have a stage show and he'd get the computers and put them on the tables and get a baseball bat and smash these computers. That was a period when he hadn't met the next person I'm going to talk about, which is the brains of the movement, which is John Roberto Casaleggio. He's the real brains of the movement. And he converted Grillo from being a destroyer of computers to being what I would call a worshipper of computers and the um, internet. And this is the man. As you can see, a child like me of the 70s. I've lost my hair now, but he still has it. And he was, he, you can see some of his philosophy is influenced by the movementism of the 70s, okay? He's, uh, but he's a very successful web entrepreneur. And he was, if you like, one of the first web entrepreneurs in Italy, giving consultancy to companies about how to use the web. He's a very smart businessman, okay? But he also has um, a great ability to suck up different, often strange ideas from all over the place, from different thinkers, yeah? And um, he has, he's the true believer in the web. In the web and
he sees it as a place for completely changing and, and transforming the current political system. And in one way, the fact that he talks like that actually misleads commentators and observers to think that the web is more important for Grillo than it actually is. Okay? But if you go to his website, you will actually be able to get and see a YouTube called Gaia. Now, Gaia is the term often used by ecologists, Gaia, to talk about the circularity, the reproduction of nature and humanity. Yeah? In this video, he will give you, he, he talks about a whole series of bizarre ideas. He talks about the fact that the world in 20 or 30 years' time, even less actually, 20 years' time, will be divided into those societies that have democratic, web-based type societies. And he seems to imply that's mostly the Western capitalist countries. And then there's the totalitarian countries who've not come to terms with the web and refuse to develop the web, and they're in opposition to this other group. And I think by this he means China, Russia, these sorts of places. So he sees that as a possible situation. He even sees the possibility that there could be a world war in 2050. Now those are his bizarre ideas that are in there, which just shows you a little bit what we're talking about here. But he does have more shorter term ideas of how um, a web-based direct democracy could work in Italy and change things. Now their analysis is that representative politics and its party system has led to disaster. They're all corrupt. They defend their interests, their privileges. State funding makes it worse. The ability of these parties to get money from their relations with business also makes them corrupt. And the list system, the electoral system, the slate system, whereby in Italy um, it's not based on geographical constituencies where people decide who their candidate should be, but parties draw up slates of candidates for whole regions, whole areas. And of course that gives tremendous power to the party bureaucracies to decide who should be the candidates. And they're totally opposed to all that. Now, their vision is that the transparency of the web, the limitless information that's available on the web, which can give everybody information about everything, the connectivity of the web, and the collective intelligence of the web will allow millions of citizens to choose their candidates based on their geographical area, and these candidates will be free from party interests, and these candidates will then go into Parliament and be controlled on an ongoing basis through the web. Okay? So there'll be direct streaming of every action they take. They will have to respect these people in Parliament, the exact electoral program they were elected on. So they will become like delegates. A bit like in a trade union, more like in a trade union, if you like, than in a uh, political party. So there'll be very, very tight control through the web of these, um, of these uh, representatives. Okay? And those representatives could be recorded at any time if they refuse to carry out the electoral wishes of the people. Now, as you can see, some of these ideas, elements of them, we perhaps would share. I mean, they are a, a radical, there's, an, there's a radical critique like of bourgeois democracy in there, okay? But of course, it's taken to the extremes. And most of all, it's done without any connection to political parties, because they reject the form of political party. And it's done without any analysis and connection between parliament and the economic system and the state. Those two things, the state and the economic system, are not truly analyzed in all of their ideas. The state which reproduces the dominant economic system of exploitation and the system of exploitation itself which makes it more difficult for workers to get involved in politics and challenge the system. Okay? They aren't analysed at all. Okay? Alongside these direct delegates, there would also be another change which, would, which also takes away the need for parties. Any group of citizens can get together and decide on a... On a Positive referendum, because in Italy at the moment you do have a referendum system, 
but you can only have a referendum to abrogate, take away a law. In other words, and also, in order to win that referendum, you have to get a very high quorum of positive votes. Okay? It does sometimes happen once with the water privatisation recently, which they won. But the new thing is that you can have referendums on a number of issues with no quorum, and if the Parliament refused to discuss those referendums, there would be the referendum voted on. There would be a vote on that referendum. So their vision is very much that all the citizens could come up with all these loads of issues, right? But they would do it without parties, but just through the power of the web. Other things they do as well, which, keep, which are interesting, which I think we would agree with as well, they limit, in the statute for the uh, Five Star Movement, is the idea of only being able to stand twice, to have two terms of office as a political representative, which I think is not a bad idea, actually. Plus, they're very strict on the money you can receive as an MP or a local councillor. All the money is decided by the movement, and it's all the money that is not used by the group is taken, given back to the government. It's not a question of, as in the old days, where the Labour movement would um, pay the Communist Party MPs a worker's salary and the rest of the money would go to the party. No. They pay the people, I think, 4,000 euros a month. That's the, the idea. 4,000 euros a month. And the actual salary is about 10,000 euros, plus all the expenses. All that 6,000 euros and the other expenses goes back to the state. They give it back to the state. Okay? They refuse to take it. That's the other big thing they do. Okay? And, of course... Um, In the end of the day, once this has been achieved, according to Grillo and Casaleggio, once this has been achieved, you won't need the movement anymore. The movement will, just as in the old Marxist analysis of the state withering away, the movement will just be no longer needed. Because if like the, the, the society will have achieved the aims, the society will be completely run on the web. All right? Everyone, this is what Casaleggio says, everyone will have a new identity in a new social network and we will all be linked to the internet all the time. It's almost like a mystical visionary vision. Okay? Just to give you another idea of this, this is like a crude diagram way of showing what I've just said. The M5 movement comes in here and takes on and breaks up this whole system. The top-down system is being destroyed in their opinion by their intervention. And you've got to remember, at the moment, they are the opposition in the Italian parliament. The PD and the PDL and Monti's group are all carrying out austerity measures. And it's only the uh, M5S movement, plus the cell to some degree, who are opposing them. So they are, they're not, they're, this is a serious force. Okay? It's not some joke group. Okay. And this is their vision. Yeah, two, this is it. Citizens, web, parliament, there's no, nobody else, okay? And this is the problem. I've just tried to explain, but just to go over it again. They completely take out this thing which, if you like, encompasses everything. The system of accumulation, the state, the parties, and they ignore the fact that political parties exist, one because of the state, one because of the the power of capital, in my opinion, but also because you're never going to get a society where all our interests are the same. Even if we get a society where we get rid of capital, we're still going to have different regional differences, different uh, issues around gender, around a whole series of issues that will have to be resolved. You can't do that unless you're allowed to organise to defend your ideas. And the only way that's been produced in history for doing that are political parties. Now, the interesting thing about all this is that there is a sort of overlap with some of these ideas and some of the ideas that come out of the movements that have existed even just recently, where there's a rejection of political parties, there re there's a rejection of the political level, a rejection of an understanding of the capitalist state, for example. And I think that it's interesting there's that overlap. So this is just summarising again what's wrong with this system, okay? 
There's no analysis by them of how these parties have become corrupt. Because it's obvious that certain parties at certain times were progressive forces. You go back into the 20th century, the Labour movement parties played a progressive role at various times. I'm thinking of the Labour Party in England after the Second World War. It, it, it helped bring about the welfare state. And I'm sure you can think of examples in your own countries of, of that. You have to explain why they became uh, corrupt, why they no longer represent American people. And the only way they'd say is it's because of the overall political system, the corruption. It's almost like an original sin analysis. It's not really very materialistic. And um, the, there's also lots of practical questions about organizing everything through individual voting through the web. First was a security question. How do you stop people cheating? How do you, Apparently, you can, I'm, not, I'm not a technical specialist, but I know people, you guys could probably tell me as well, people can set up all sorts of false addresses or whatever and vote thousands of times. And in fact, when they try to do this themselves for electing candidates or decide on who they should, should support for the president elections, the whole thing broke down. They had to rerun the thing. So there's lots of problems about this web-based voting at all times. And I think there's also another problem. Political parties are there to bring together and analyze all the different single issue um, demands because the way it appears with the Five Star Movement is all these individuals or groups of citizens will bring um, demands on their representatives, their delegates, but they're all going to be distinct demands. They're not going to be linked together. There's going to be no moment where the political party or a political force puts it together into a coherent vision, an alternative vision for society as a whole. There's, there's no attempt to, to, to have that. And I think that's a big problem. Um, so it, it really, there's a sort of supervision, superficial individualism, if you like. And uh, what's interesting as well is that um, one, one person who has uh, looked into this and thought about it a bit, is, it's... Um, a book where Marco Bazzani has written something which is very interesting. And he says that you can understand why this has come about a bit in Italy, because of the degradation of the system over 20 years of the Second Republic. You've had Berlusconi, you had Bossi, and you've had this sort of use of television, if you like, to, uh, to destroy uh, the political culture in many ways. And therefore, this sort of populism of Bossi, populism of of uh, Berlusconi allowed the culture in Italy to make it easier for someone like Grillo and the, and the Five Star Movement to have a hold and to get some support. And he, he claims, this guy, that the, the web's an ambiguous, an ambiguous, chaotic medium with a multiplier effect that lends itself to Beppe Grillo's what we call millionaireism, you know, the end of the world, everything is messed up, everything's got to be changed, yeah? And his cocktail of various ideas. Beppe Grillo, if you go to his website, will have bits and pieces from Renzo Piano, from uh, Stiglitz, from all different people he's sort of read an article about, yeah? He's, he's, he's a very good example of an autodidact, uh, Grillo, who gets fascinated by some of these ideas and brings them into the web, and it's a whole mixture of things, okay? And at the same time, his, as we saw with the boat and his use of language, the web, as a very much a visual medium, and a, one which you don't necessarily read whole lots of text, is quite well suited to those big, vulgar, uh, satirical, comic interventions. And all, so that lends itself to his pol politics. And um, the... the, the there's this illusion that's created as well, I think, with the web. It can be created. I'm not saying it's always the case. But there's this illusion that you as a person are directly democratic, democratically involved by voting. Just by the fact that you're able to sit on your computer, click your button, and you vote for something or other, whether it's an online petition or something else, gives the illusion that you can have an impact. You can actually change things that way. And if you think about it... Um, this sort of thing is encouraged by capitalist companies all the time. You're always being asked for your opinion, for clicking on things. And, and in many ways, this organization of politics through the web can reproduce, if you like, the 
the isolation of us from one from another and, if you like, the individualization of politics. It doesn't have to be a course completely. And one thing he never mentions in all this talk about direct democracy, one thing he never mentioned is the contradiction between taking on the political parties, reforming parliament, and the situation in the workplace, the situation in the place where millions of Italian people work. We have a situation in Fiat at the moment where Marchioni, the new boss of uh, Fiat, has been ramming through a huge attack on the rights of tra the basic rights of trade unions to organize freely. <coughs> they, they've managed to get an agreement with the other trade unions to um, prevent workers choosing the trade unions that they want to represent them. Okay? It's like a national contract which stops the democracy of workers. Grillo has nothing to say about that. The, five, the M5 movement has nothing to say about the question of direct democracy within the workplace. There's a dictatorship of the market, a dictatorship of capital that's not challenged by Grillo and direct democracy. It's just left on one side. Because, of course, say you had this new parliament with a majority of M5S people passing laws that can be very progressive. They might pass a law, for example, that, um, I don't know, uh, pass a law that nationalizes some key capitalist company. In, in Italy, now, and, and, and threats to do others as well. In that situation, all the extra parliamentary power of those companies will be unleashed. They will use whatever means they can to stop the will of parliament, okay? And if you've got, if you've got to try and stop that counter-offensive, you've got to talk about democratic self-organization outside parliament, outside this uh, some, somehow perfect idealized place. So that's the other thing, of course. The guerrilla people idealize the Italian constitution in many ways and idealize bourgeois democracy. They idealize it because they, they feel if we can change the, get, get rid of the political caste, get rid of these people, change the rules a bit, then we'll have a good society. And they're fundamentally naive and idealist on that. Because at the end of the day, it's not the political caste that's the cause of austerity. It's not the political caste. It's not politicians. They play a role in reproducing the continuation of austerity. They play a role in not challenging austerity, but they're not the source of austerity. The source of austerity comes from the nature of our system of exploitation, which means because of the falling rate of profit, because they need to reestablish a better rate of profit, they're having to take all these measures. It's a systematic structural thing. It's not to do with individual politicians. It's not even to do with Merkel very much. Right? And that's where he makes his mistake. Anyway, even if, even if this recipe he has for improving things, and in some ways he could improve things with some of these things, even if it was, even if it was a good thing, there's a whole problem about how he uses this inside the five-star movement. Just last week, uh, a senator, Gambero, a woman, was expelled from the five-star movement. There's a number of other people who are going to join the mixed group in the Italian parliament because they refuse to accept the way in which Grillo and Casaleggio and the staff organize the movement, okay? Because they organize it in such a way that it's very hard to... Uh, develop a political culture, even develop a way of operating in Parliament. Because if you don't allow political structures, it's very hard for all these new MPs to work out what to do. Because they're kept very much separate from all other political parties. It operates in many ways like a sect. Okay? Um, they're not allowed to go on talk shows on TV. They're, there's no alliance with any other parties. That's not necessarily wrong but it means they're very insulated and kept apart, right? You cannot have a horizontal meeting, yeah? For example, I've just got a slide after that which shows you that. This is the way it's organized, right? You've got the website in the middle with the staff who are not elected, organized by Casaleggio on management, modern management lines, he trains them. But then you've got all your groups in the different towns, the line gets given down to them, 
They're allowed to select candidates for election, but the political content, the political content of what programmes they stand on is defined by a group. Okay? And individuals from the groups, these are the little lines at the top from Milan, individuals can send in loads of messages, lo lots and lots of comments and mess even small criticisms can be made on the web. But it's not systematically organised. If, for example, myself in Milan thinks that Grillo's structure is wrong, and I want to discuss with people in Florence or Torino, I'm not allowed to. Tovalazzo, to sorry, Tovalazzi, um, two or three years ago, wanted to do this, and he was uh, moved out of the movement very quickly. And the way they move people out of the movement, they expel people, it's very interesting. Grillo decides, or Casaleggio decides, that they've put themselves outside the movement. And Grillo and Casaleggio own the symbol. It's not, there's no constitution like normal parties where it's like nobody's individual property, the symbol. It's the individual property of Grillo. It's registered as Grillo's property. Right? So he can legally decide who can use that or not. It's like a, a brand that he decides on. So the five-star sort of symbol is his symbol. Okay? So he can move it out. Okay? And that's what he did. He took away the right of Tovalatsi to use that so he can no longer stand for the movement. And then what they do in the worst Stalinist tradition, they have a vote online. Do you agree or not to get rid of this person? And of course, all the information about that person is controlled by Grillo and Casaleggi online. So you get one side. It's the worst, if you like, it's, it's very ironic because. They talk about not having a party and all that, but in fact, some of their practices reproduce the worst aspects of the most stylized parties that we've ever seen. Anyway, um, and if you look at the site, it's very interesting. I, I can't get it up now necessarily, but it'd be interesting if you look at it. If you go to Beppe Grillo's site and see it, you will see that um, in many ways it's quite lively. I mean, there's, there's, there's lots of satirical videos, YouTube videos, taking the mickey, uh, satirizing Enrico Letta, the new Prime Minister, or Berlusconi, very funny things, right? But there's no real debate with any other forces. There's no links to other websites that might be interesting. If you go to the Left Unity website, for example, we have lots of discussions and people have different views and there's platforms being put and there's going to be platforms for the Congress coming up and there's links to other organisations. No, the Beppe Grillo website is very close, very insular. If like it's um, a good website, a good use of the web should be that it's um, you know open, centrifugal, transparent, conflictual. There's all the opposite: central petal, very closed, no real discussion. Okay, all right. And at the same time, it's very interesting. There's lots of advertisements on the site for Microsoft, Google and everything else. So it sort of shows you that they've not really got an understanding of that aspect that we talked about earlier. Okay? It's like a suggestion box, if you like, the site in many ways. You can make suggestions, like in a capitalist company or a, a school or some a public sector organization. You could put ideas in a suggestion box, but that's it. You're not allowed to discuss and organize in a political way. Okay? And it's super defensive. I mean, it, if you look at it, a lot of the posts are responses to people who have criticised the M5S movement. That's what it is. It reminds me of some of the sectarian left sites I've seen in my life. Okay? Um, and in fact, I just wanted to quote something from a, a feminist back in the 1970s, somebody called Jo Freeman. And she wrote a very interesting paper called The Tyranny of Structuralist, Structuralistness, the lack of structure, that when you have no structure, it can actually be just as undemocratic as the so-called party structures. This is a debate, I think, also in the Occupy and the uh, general movements, you know, that having no structure doesn't mean there's no structure, right? And she says, when informal elites are combined with a myth of structurelessness, there can be no attempt to put limits on the use of power. It becomes capricious. Shows you that some of the stuff written before is very good still. 1970. 1970 that was written, and it's still true today, okay? So, there is a structure in the M5S, and anyway. 
Let's move on. I'm just getting on to my line. I'm not doing too badly. Uh, 40. Um, done that. Right, it's the final slide. And it overlaps with some of the discussions you've had already and some you have tomorrow and tonight and everything else. So just, you know, the sort of things we can, we can reflect about Grilla, but these are some of the things that come out, okay? I think the discussion we had this morning about access and ownership is very important, and education. Because if you want to involve people using the web more, you've got to have access to it. You've got to have time to do it. Because what's the fundamental flaw with this idea of web-based democracy? The fundamental flaw is that you can't do that if people are working 40, 50 hours a week, or people are, 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 are not got a level of education which enables them to engage with those problems. You, you've got to talk about a different sort of society if you're doing those things, okay? Um, of course, in the work of the M5 movement, they do raise things like free connections. They do think, raise things about changing the school. So there are some very positive, don't get me wrong, there's some very positive demands within their, uh, within their work. They also call for a minimum citizen's income, I think it's another good demand. There's lots of positive things in, their, in, their, in what they're doing, okay? Um, we talked about that in the last session. I won't talk about privacy again because we talked about it already in the last session. But the, the, the third one, skilling up. To, the left groups, the left formations, Parti de Gauche, the Delinka, ourselves, other people, we've got to learn how to use the web effectively. And I think we can learn from some of the techniques used by Gorilla, using videos, using images, the use of our language. All these things we can do, direct streaming. We had a very successful... People's Assembly Against Austerity, just the other day in London, where 4,000 people met for a whole day in London to discuss the work and the campaign against austerity. Um, and the great thing about it is if, if you were too ill to go or you couldn't make it that weekend, you had a wedding or something, you can see all the videos of all the speeches and some of the discussion on the website. And that's fantastic. That's a terrific way of reinforcing it. But, of course, you've got to get the, the, the uh, relationship right. The key thing was the People's Assembly, where 4,000 people actually went and discussed and met each other and were able to get a morale boost as well, feel better about the campaign. That was the key thing. The web, reinforced, reproduced, helped it. Also helped to mobilise for it, of course. But the key thing is the actual uh, movements. Okay? Also, I think we've got to reflect on our internal democracy. Just recently in the UK... There has been a, a very interesting story, or not story, event, where probably the, the, the largest radical left group, some of you might have heard of it, the Socialist Workers' Party, the SWP, um, uh, about two to 3,000 members, they had a, a case in their party where a, a senior member of their party, over 50 years old, had a sexual relationship with somebody who was, I think, 18 at the time, or 17 or 18. And subsequently to their relationship ending, there was accusations of sexual abuse, rape and everything else, okay? And basically, this party, the SVP, did not handle this at all well. I won't go into details because it's boring, but it, it handled it very badly. And one of the things they did very badly was when there was a faction or a tendency formed to, to, to dispute or to argue against the leadership's way of dealing with it, and these people, a few of them, before they even formed the tendency, had a, uh, what do you call it, a discussion on Facebook, where there's three or four of them against get on Facebook. And as soon as that was seen, they were expelled from the party. And you just cannot organise parties these days and not allow people to talk to one another on Facebook. It's just ludicrous. And so, as a result of this, there's been a split from the SWP. The group I work with are working with them very closely, and we're going to hopefully regroup. And one of the things that's coming out of that discussion is, is to think about how do we organise internally in the 21st century? You've got to have the right to tendencies. You've got to have the right to discussion. You can't have some sort of iron discipline where everybody says the same thing. It's crazy. You can't have one person dictating the line for the whole party. You've got to have a continual discussion, and you've got to allow people in the same party to stand in meetings and put different views occasionally. Of course, up to the point where it doesn't destroy what the party stands for, obviously, but, you know, within tactical discussions. You've got to have all that. And the web will continually 
come up against and destroy any groups today that try to go back to an old... In fact, Lenin and the Bolsheviks and everybody else didn't actually have that approach for most of the time. Later on they did in the Civil War and everything else, but, but in the early part of the development of the Bolsheviks, they were very open, very democratic. People could stand up and put out different newspapers, debate openly. And we've got to go back to that rather than a distortion of uh, political organisation. I think the other thing is we can use the web today to improve the struggle, right? To inform people about what's going on in local government, national government, in companies. Demand direct streaming of the negotiations going on, for example. That's one of the things that the M5S do very well. When they had to discuss with Bazani and the PD leadership about a possible coalition government, they streamed the meeting. Didn't do it very well, actually, because the discussion wasn't very good. But the idea of not having anything hidden from the people who voted for them, I think it's correct. We should do that sort of thing. We should argue for that. There shouldn't be the secrecy, okay? And I think we can also use the, the, the web to involve people more, to discuss local council issues and all this sort of thing. We can do all those things. So it's important for now. But also, I think, if you talk about visions in the future and, and any sort of social society we might ever achieve, whether, you know, whenever it might be, I think the web does provide a basis for conceptualizing a situation where you have lots of different levels of democracy, independent organization of working people uh, and everything else, but the, the, the web is complex enough and quick enough to be able to link up those things and to if you like, articulate them in a way that you know, the earliest people who thought about social democracy never could even believe of. Yeah? So I think that is important. It's not individuals clicking on, their, on the web, but you might have a meeting of, uh, I don't know, the Soviet of, of Luxembourg who wants to coordinate with uh, Liège or something, and it can all be done very, can make, have a discussion, decide that, then pass over your resolution very quickly to the other people. In fact, a couple of years ago when there were the student movements in France, I think that's the sort of thing they were doing. They were, they were able to have discussions in the assemblies and then communicate very quickly with all the other uh, colleges in struggle to share the decisions. That's fantastic. That should be done. That's a great way of using the, the web. But um, just to finish, um, I think it's also important to uh, guard against exaggerated or idealist claims about the internet and the web. I mean, I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with a book written by Paul Mason in English called It's All Kicking Off Everywhere. He, he's a very important journalist in England. He's sold a lot of books. And he theorizes the new movements around the world in Egypt, in Turkey, and all these other places. Um, and he, he, he over-theorizes, in my opinion, the idea that the very nature of human consciousness is changing. I think they go too far when he talks about that and exaggerates the importance of it and fundamentally uh, rejects the, tends to reject the political party form. Because I think at the end of the day, as long as we have an analysis of the state that re where the state is a central body that's external to people that reproduces the dominant system. As long as you have that, and as long as you have an idea that there will, from time to time, be crises and time to time be projects where whole, the, the majority of people, majority of working people might decide they want to change things and improve their living standards in a, in a fundamental way. As long as you have that idea, which is based on materialist analysis, I think you do need to talk about political parties. Now, it doesn't have to be the same old-fashioned, you know, narrow view of the working class forming its political parties. I agree with you there. Particularly not the idea that the working class has only one party. That's ridiculous. This was the idea developed by Stan and everybody else after the, in the 30s, where you, the, the working class can have one party. It's ridiculous. There will always be a plurality of parties, I think. Uh, obviously, there will be, to take power, you will need to have the support of more than one party, but this idea of not being able to have a political project, which is a, is a theory that has been developed by Ernest Laclau, Louis Sev, other people within the movement. So sometimes come with this idea, you, 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 we're just a question of, of, of the commons and huge numbers of diverse campaigns. And there's, there's no possibility of centralizing projects anymore. 
because the working class doesn't exist in the same way anymore. I think that's got to be argued against. And I think the web sometimes is used to reinforce those arguments. And I think we've got to argue against it because lots of younger people in particular are attracted by these ideas. I, mean, I went to a couple of meetings in London recently where there was quite a lot of support for this idea. And even today, on the demonstrations, in the struggles, you often get a reaction against political parties. We've even seen this in Turkey and uh, Brazil, funnily enough. There's been people who have uh, rejected any idea of having a, a political party. And I think we have to argue patiently for the correctness of the need for political parties. Um, I also think there's a whole eco, 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 ecological argument we're going to as well about uh, the internet. There's, there's an element in which um, uh, in order to develop an eco-socialist society, a society where our relationship to the natural world is on a better, more normal, balanced way, that we mustn't be too much <coughs> absorbed in the virtual world. We have to have a relationship to the natural world, and that contradicts the idea, I think, of, a, of overdoing the virtual world. So, to sum up, in my opinion, the web is, is more than just a simple tool, it's obviously not just a simple tool like any other. It's a qualitative change from the printed media and from books, right? In other words, today we can do things much more quickly. We have a cheaper way of doing things. A small left movement can produce books, can communicate with lots of people much more easily. The entry level, the entry costs are lower, yeah? Just like capitalist enterprises. That you can start a company much more easily now with the internet. My cousin started a a web company costing 3,000 euros. It's the same for politics. You can, get in a, you can get in quicker. But long term, you cannot, if you like, sustain that just through the web. Yeah? You can't sustain it just through And I think web-based uh, parties, the influence of the web, is strong where you've got conditions of repression. If you haven't got any possibility of expressing yourself without it, like in Iran, we saw it in Egypt to some degree, um, Turkey to some degree, or where political representation is completely dominated by mainstream parties that don't want to do anything to improve things. Then again, you get that possibility. But once you start to form a political movement, you're faced with the question of how to organize politically. So it's more than a tool and less than a structure, in my opinion, of the internet. More than a tool, but a lot less than a structure. That's what I want to say now. I probably forgot other things. Thank you very much.